recording. So thank you. Today we have Dr. Karima Bulmagd joining us for the second time. Thank you, Dr. Karim, for joining our webinar. And the floor is yours. Well, I'm so I'm sorry for uh, the delay uh, for many reasons, and uh, thank you for inviting me, uh, Dr. Mirhat and Hashem. Uh, and I have a lot of slides, but I would uh, go through uh, uh, some of them. Uh, and then we can stop at any time if we're on overtime, and then I can complete the talk, the Slaka story. Now, how many people are listening to us? Right now we're 10 people, but the number should rise. Okay. So we're going to just, uh, just an update. <clears throat> I'll remind all of us of the advances or the cutting uh, edge knowledge on the advances in the pathophysiology and management of uh, gastrointestinal failure. And uh, when I think we all need to know that uh, uh, the gut plays a major role in the uh, energy hemostasis of the body, and I call it gut homeostasis, play a major role in the whole body uh, energy equilibrium. And you can see in your left-hand side, uh, if you go on the positive side, you develop morbid obesity with all of its morbidities. And, uh, and then on the right side, when I describe it, I thought this is uh, to remind me of the Egyptian mummies, when you have severe malnutrition, and uh, you develop uh, uh, mass loss and uh, lack to survive. And then, uh, yeah, just to, some of the slides may reflect uh, my the last uh, four decades uh, uh, journey uh, with the gut. And I always say, uh, you know, always love our gut and we sometimes also hate our gut. And particularly when we develop gut failure. Uh, but the one thing that make me interested in the gut after my long journey with liver transplant is um, I think the gut plays the major role in our uh, daily uh, function. And I always say, trust your gut. And uh, actually, when I did my uh, uh, chief residency rotation in Pittsburgh in 1996, I was asked to give a grand round, which usually prof inv invited professors to give these uh, talks or uh, uh, speakers. But they asked me, although I was doing a chief residence rotation, to give a talk at the University of Pittsburgh, the Grand Round. And uh, ironically, uh, at the time, there was no internet. There was oh, none of the above we have now. So I have to go to the library. And after I uh, finished, uh, I was on call that night. And I came up with that statement from Josh Billing in the book that was full of dust and covered with dust in the library. <clears throat> and uh, the first page which came to this statement. Uh, it's like I was in the right place at the right time. And the, uh, the uh, uh, statement was say, I have finally come to the conclusion that a good reliable sets of bowels is worth more to a man than any quantity of brains. And this is the fanatic uh, uh, statement um, in, in, in the uh, 18th century. And it's uh, stand to me, that was an eye opening for me to focus more on the small bowel transplant and gut failure. And uh, over the years, I learned also that there is a strong connection between the gut and the brain. And over the years, all this came to play with new advances in the microbiota and the neurotransmitters 
in the motility and all of this uh, intricate function of the gut. The gut had a brain of its own and the gut, the brain of the gut communicate constantly with our central brain and vice versa and go, go through what I call it gut brain axis. And that's why you see uh, most of the patient with uh, chronic gut failure, they have a lot of psychiatric issues uh, because of the lack of the neuropeptides. And uh, <clears throat> the intestine is a unique organ, um, similar to other many organs, uh, particularly the, uh, the liver and the kidney. There is a lot of uh, intestinal reserve, like uh, when we do the hepatic reserve in the old days. And none of these organs we usually can measure uh, the function reserve of them, including the intestine. As of today, they still wouldn't have any test to measure the hepatic reserve or the kidney reserve. We usually know that there's deficiency when they, uh, you see evidence of dysfunction or failure. The intestine is a unique organ. So if you look at the surface area of the intestine, it's equivalent to a tennis court. Uh, because of the length of the bowel, because of the, the, the villi and the microvilli. So this is created the whole surface area of the gut to um, uh, uh, help absorbing all the nutrients uh, uh, we need. And that is the advantage also of this is the intestine have the tendency to adapt. And even if we you have enough reserve, if you lose some of the intestine, the uh, gut can still absorb uh, enough nutrient to maintain our uh, uh, nutritional autonomy and homeostasis. Um, the only drug or the only chemical uh, that can measure the extent of the enterocyte mass is the citrulline, plasma citrulline level. It's a very simple uh, measure. Uh, you can measure in a, a sophisticated uh, biochemistry lab. And um, uh, we can see that if you measure the citrulline level, depends on the level can tell you, this is a control, this is a patient have transient gut uh, uh, failure, and those who have a permanent gut failure. Uh, but unfortunately, usually does not, correlate accurate, accurately with the, uh, with the uh, enterocyte cell mass. Um, and, uh, but still, this is the best we, could, we have at the present time. When the gut failure developed, uh, has, uh, I developed this slides in 1991, that I categorize the causes of gut failure into four, five main types. One we all familiar with is the short gut syndrome uh, acquired or surgical or some rarely congenital. And then the dysmotility syndromes, uh, which when I'm seeing more and more in Egypt now, uh, a lot uh, more uh, than uh, uh, was prevalent uh, 20 or 30 years ago for many reasons. And then the neoplastic disorders um, like Gardner syndrome and uh, a lot of other uh, disorders that uh, locally uh, or neoplastic and locally uh, malignant. And then the enterocyte dysfunction which is mostly congenital uh, like Tuft syndrome, microvillus inclusion and acquired after irradiation uh, particularly in the old days when the irradiation dose was too heavy for any uh, reproductive cancer or, or, or colon cancer, or particular rectal cancer. And then the portum is enteric vena thrombosis, which is one of my favorite uh, um, topic. When you have extensive portum is enteric vena thrombosis, and I'm seeing it more and more in Egypt now in kids and adults due to a hypercoagulable uh, states like protein uh, SC and antithrombin three deficiencies, as well as factor five mutation, which the 
prevalence of the uh, uh, factor five mutation is about 20% in the uh, Middle East, if you look for it. It uh, does not mean everybody with uh, factor five mutation will develop portomous enteric bound with thrombosis, but some of them do. And then in the kids, usually from the uh, uh, adverse for the umbilical uh, uh, cord infection and other reasons. The causes of the short gut syndrome, which this would be our main focus in this talk, uh, is different in adults versus children. It means the patient developed gangrenous, gangrenous is small bowel. And uh, uh, gangrenous, my wife is calling me, she's gonna divorce me. It developed gangrenous is small bowel. And, uh, <clears throat> Uh, and then they lose the bowel or surgical mishap, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the, um, you can see here the leading causes of the uh, uh, short gut in the adults are vascular occlusion, which I'm seeing it very often now, uh, get through thanks to social media, through WhatsApp, like a, 35 years old girl, uh, she uh, had acute abdomen explored somewhere in Egypt, one of the hospitals. Uh, they uh, uh, did not take the dead bowel out. Uh, they closed her up. Her sister called me uh, uh, and sent me a message through WhatsApp that she has two young kids, four and six. And uh, so I get one of my team uh, that I developed in a nice hospital, the charity hospital, you, you, you may hear about it or you already heard about it. And um, uh, one of them took the intestine out and uh, she recovered from that. And she has about 40 centimeter of small bowel with the entire colon, about 10 centimeter of the jejunum. And um, we will, when I come back, we we'll reconstruct here and rehabilitate here. And I, uh, and I will show you if we have time to do it this time or for our next uh, uh, talk series. Crohn's disease is more and more prevalent now in Egypt, but I'm not seeing a lot of patients with lost the gut, but with uh, 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 surgical Crohn's disease. And I'm trying to increase awareness of the uh, gastroenterologist that uh, you have to differentiate between chronic uh, Crohn's and surgical Crohn's disease when they develop uh, surgical complications or uh, surgically uh, treated complication that the surgeons has to play a role in that instead of making the patient suffer. Abdominal trauma, which thank God is not as common in Egypt, or if it is a blunt abdominal trauma, usually uh, this patient did not get resuscitated very well because of la lack of a trauma centers in the Egypt and mostly die, but some who survived, I have few of them was able to fix them. Radiation enteritis and surgical adhesions from any abdominal surgery, particularly gynecological surgery that this patient has. Children is a more benign disease, gastroschisis, intestinal atresia, necrotizing enterocolitis, and valvulus, mostly in patients who had um, <clears throat> previous gastroschisis and congenital malrotation, which is uh, congenital anomalies. Uh, we used to treat it with the LATS procedure in the old days, which doesn't prevent them from valvulus. And they developed the new operation that I published in, um, in October last year, presented at the American Surgical Association and um, increasing awareness of pediatric surgeons all across the world uh, to treat these patients with the new operation uh, rather than waiting for them to lose their gut. And the types of short gut syndrome as defined by the American Surgical, American uh, Society of Gastroenterology, is this type one, which most of the patients, you lose proximal jejunum, type two, you lose a distal ileum with the ileocecal valve, and type three, you lose uh, most of the hind gut and mid gut except part of the jejunum. And type four, that's my uh, added uh, uh, terminology for the, uh, the classic three types. Type four, when most of the patient lose everything all the way to uh, the first, the second or third part of the DDM. And um, uh, 
the major question usually you try to teach the medical student and residents, when did you expect the patient to, to develop permanent uh, gut failure and the need for lifelong TPN? Um, and that is, you look at the anatomy, uh, you know, if you have less than 35 centimeter of a small bowel with eugenoily and anastomosis, uh, or you have less than six centimeter of a small bowel with eugenoclonic anastomosis, or uh, you don't have colon or ileum and you have endogenostomy, you need uh, more than 115 centimeter of small bowel uh, for something to work on and uh, with the gut rehabilitation techniques that we developed recently, this patient can come off TPN. Am I, am I okay? Is everybody following? Yes, we're following. Okay, so I'm not too fast, too slow? It's, you're okay. All right. <laughs> and that is, you can see with the short gut syndrome, it's not just that the bowel is short. There is a lot of patho underlying pathology, the gastroenterologist, and I have Dr. Abir uh, Abdul Latif. Uh, she joined me at the Nas Hospital and uh, I'm uh, teaching her uh, uh, how to take care of these patients. And uh, also I have Dr. Ines McGower, McGower, the gastroenterologist and nutritionist that joined the team recently to take care of this patient because this is a specialty measures, it has a major defect in Egypt and it has, we have to establish a multidisciplinary team approach to uh, maximize the care of this patient, which will improve, uh, reduce their needs uh, of, of transplant or TPN it's also um, uh, avoid the need for a transplant, which hasn't existed yet in Egypt. Hopefully soon they'll be able to introduce it and also improve their quality of life and reduce the cost of, uh, of, of the clinical care. This is when you lose a significant part of the intestine, the intestine had the power to go through the adaptation phase. And uh, this is the uh, you have the resection here, this early treatment, conservative treatment, and uh, then the intestine start to uh, uh, develop the adaptation or go through the process of the adaptation. And this is a spontaneous adaptation curve. Uh, if you just defeat the gut, and uh, time is usually in our favor for the gut to adapt, it needs more time up to two years, as you can see here, is still adaptation process continue, spontaneous adaptation. And then if you wanna accelerate the adaptation process, then we manipulate the gut <clears throat> with uh, different drugs, uh, new drugs we have, or surgical uh, intervention uh, to, um, to lengthen the bowel. And, um, and, that, and that's what we call it, the uh, 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 late treatment for the adaptation process, even up to after two years, you still could help the intestine to adapt with the uh, surgical uh, rehabilitative measures and as well as uh, medical with biologic agents. And you can see here the mechanism of the adaptation. It, is, it doesn't, uh, no data to, sh to show that the enterocyte proliferate, but it's uh, a f the adaptation process, process go through hypertrophy of the intestinal villi. And I, I teach the kids, uh, or I call them the kids, but I teach the, uh, uh, the new generation in the operating room. And when you feel the bowel, you have thickened the bowel is because of the hypertrophy of the muscular system and the uh, intestinal blood becomes very hypertrophic. Uh, see here, with you do fat feeding, how the blood becomes more hypertrophic than those who are in TPN. So the most important factor in enhancing the adaptation process uh, is the uh, initiation of enteral feeding as soon as you can. The colon also play a major role 
in the um, in the adaptation process, and the colon becomes like intestine. And uh, you can see the carbohydrate that's not absorbed by the sh by the short short lengthened bowel go to the uh, colon, and the, with the thank to the uh, bacteria in the colon, it changes the carbohydrate to short chain fatty acids could be absorbed as an energy source. And that was behind the new operation I developed uh, called uh, serial transverse coloplasty. Um, the management of uh, gut failure <clears throat> uh, go through a phases, an evolution phase. In the 60s, there's really no, there was no treatment for it. If the child uh, or the adult lost most of the bowel, they die because there's nothing you can do for them. In the 70s, uh, uh, intravenous nutrition, total parental nutrition came to play. And now I'll give you a little bit of one, two slides about the history of that. And that's what we're missing in Egypt now that's killing me. I cannot do transplant. I cannot do gut rehab unless the patient survived the first event. And the first event before the adaptation started and before I intervene with them, we need total parental nutrition. In Egypt, it is now it's very primitive. And I initiated this process in um, uh, uh, Mustashfa Gawit uh, Takhassusi. Uh, uh, um, and there was a small, developed small unit there with Dr. Uh, um, uh, Maher uh, Abbas at the time, uh, five, six years ago, and Dr. Inas McGowan played a major role in having a unit to develop or deformulate uh, the TPN. Um, and uh, this developed in, uh, it's a standard of care on all over the world, even in Saudi Arabia now, they can have home parental nutrition. We need to work together, all of us, to develop this at the, at the home delivery TPN, not for the patient to stay in the hospital and fit and then, uh, uh, and then die from infection and uh, nobody can live at the hospital forever. And, um, but the TPN has uh, some issues, uh, although it's life-saving, but there is a, a list of complication could happen from the TPN. In the 80s, there was some advancement in some medical and surgical treatment were very primitive, uh, but uh, the, uh, uh, the, the medical and surgical community was trying to help uh, particularly the kids. How can they adapt and how can they come off TPN, but were not very unsuccessful. That's why in the 1990s, I was at the right time and the right place uh, and uh, we initiated the uh, uh, gut transplantation or intestinal multivisceral transplantation, or you call it abdominal visceral transplantation. Uh, but most recently, I, I use the term gut transplantation because it's really gut transplantation. I know the word gut is a, a British word, a uh, little bit harsh, but it's actually reflected the real thing. Uh, it is gut transplantation. And then um, after a journey of about uh, 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 10 years, I started thinking about how can we do surgical gut rehabilitation uh, for these patients uh, after knowing some of the issues that came up or evolved with the short and long-term complications of intestinal and multivisceral transplantation. And maybe uh, this, uh, uh, the rest of the talk will focus on the visceral transplantation this time. And if we don't have enough time, we go uh, through uh, what is gut rehabilitation and how can we teach in the new generation to rehabilitate the gut medically and surgically. Um, Stanley, Dr. Dedrick uh, was a very nice man. I think he was either in Philadelphia or Boston or both together. He passed away a few years ago. <clears throat> I had dinner with him at um, one of our meetings in uh, Buenos Aires. 
and uh, uh, one of the young uh, uh, transplant surgeon uh, from Europe introduced us very uh, in a very funny way. He said, this is Dr. Dedrick, uh, who initiated the TPN, and this is Dr. They call me Kareem, and this is Dr. Kareem, who uh, developed a transplant to get rid of the TPN. It was a funny talk at the time. Unfortunately, uh, this, as you can see, uh, when they uh, developed the TPN intravenous nutrition uh, uh, bags, when the babies were dying from starvation, as you can see here, and they really uh, they contributed significantly to the field of gut failure by saving the life of the kids because without doing that, I was not able to achieve what I achieved uh, in the evolution of the surgical treatment of gut failure. Um, so in the 1990s, as I said earlier, I was in the right time, right place. Starzl uh, did a few multivisceral transplant before my arrived to Pittsburgh and before we, we uh, developed the uh, K506 what we call it now the program for tacrolimus, you are all familiar with. And uh, we started in the uh, 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 treating the liver patients and we uh, saw superior efficacy of tacrolimus compared to cyclosporin. So he called me to his office and said, you, uh, you need to uh, start this mobile transplant. This drug will work for the small bowel patients and there is no one I can trust and I can uh, admire more than you starting the, uh, the, uh, the program. And uh, the reason uh, the testin required a very powerful drug like tacrolimus, because if you can see here, early experience uh, in the animal and few humans that the transplant didn't survive because the patient go from rejection and then if you reject the bowel, all the intestinal mucosa sloughed and the bacteria invade the body and patient die from infection. And this you have to take the intestine out. And a, a small percentage, up to 10%, they develop graft versus host disease, as you can see it after bone marrow, but it's more fatal than the one you see with the bone marrow transplant. The reason for that, because the intestine is a full of lymphoid uh, tissues, and uh, you know it's used to be uh, called a forbidden organ for many years because of its high immunogenicity. So through the first decades of my experience or my journey with the intestine, I went through despair and hope. One day I, I, I feel terrible. The other day I said, well, I have to start again. And I went through this, and I, as a matter of fact, if you read my publication carefully, you can sense this uh, to the extent I hold the program in 1995 in a, a moratorium because patients start dying from different reasons. And then after six months, change the immunosuppression protocols and reinitiated the process that uh, most of the centers worldwide followed. And uh, this is the, uh, uh, actually it should be a, uh, uh, the landmark paper that showing that the intestine came to stay after many decades of, uh, of failure. And, um, that is a paper, it's published in Advances in Surgery and was actually maybe a review article at the time. And uh, at that same time, I was able to convince the, the American government to consider a small bowel transplant as the standard of care for patients who had gut failure and no longer can be maintained on TPM. And I did that very strict uh, criteria to protect the patient from being transplanted by small centers or centers has no experience. And then instead of living on TPM, they may die from the transplant. And I put very strict criteria patient center has to done 10 cases a year. 
and the survival, one year survival more than 60%. And this is a picture of uh, when I was able to convince the uh, American government and they announced that, uh, uh, and then I get uh, uh, the, uh, have a nice party for me. You can see I was still young. And um, that is my late mother was with me in the United States. And I loved her dearly. And actually when she died at the age of 96, I buried her uh, now, there is four main types of intestinal transplant or gut transplant. One is the, uh, in your left hand side here, this isolated intestine. The yellow colors are the organ transplanted. The red colors are the residual native organs. Isolated intestine, liver intestine and pancreas. We early on, we were not transplanting the pancreas. We have to do biliary reconstruction, et cetera, et cetera. This was associated with some technical problems, particularly in the pediatric patients. So I modified the technique to include the uh, pancreas with the uh, liver and the intestine to maintain the C loop and uh, avoid the need for biliary reconstruction and to maintain continuity of the gut. And this is a full multiviscera when all the organs in the abdomen is transplanted and a few patients who in renal failure will give them the kidney in addition to the five organs, stomach, the DNM, pancreas, intestine, and liver. And then I think in 1993, there was a competition about the liver. This patient, some of these patients have normal liver. We didn't know any better than that. And we thought replacing the native liver with a transplanted liver may correct their hypercoagulable state, some of the patients. And in 1993, I modified the technique to preserve the native liver and, and give the liver from the same donor to another liver recipient. So, uh, so uh, recipients could share organs as life-saving procedures. And this is a modified multiviscera that the stomach, the and pancreas, and the intestine, and will preserve it in the native uh, liver. And this is the, uh, uh, the, uh, the journey with the uh, retrieval or the harvesting technique. This is a slide I show it to. Um, uh, can you see my cursor? You can when I'm making, uh, or you don't. Yes. Can you see it? That's good. So this is in your left upper side. You can see the surgical anatomy of the gut. <laughs> Basic principles: you have three major vessels: <clears throat> the celiac trunk, superior mesenteric artery, and the inferior mesenteric artery. In your upper right hand side, they can see the intestine in the pocket of eyes. And then this is the multivisceral graft. You can see the stomach, duodenum, and pancreas, intestine, and liver. You can see the spleen. Um, I never recommend or I never did transplant the spleen for these patients because of many immunological causes. And one of my colleagues who was trained me with me in Pittsburgh and then went to Miami, try giving the, leave the spleen with some of this patient, the kids, and they got in trouble. So nobody, I uh, still don't recommend anybody to maintain the donor uh, spleen with the multivisceral organs. And this is a uh, very interesting uh, donor with a three days old baby that uh, I refused to take the organs and her, uh, his father, uh, was a physician called me in Pittsburgh. This is in 1996, 96, yes. And uh, he said, we try. I said, this uh, liver is uh, deficient in all the coagulation factors. And most of this patient develop uh, thrombosis of the vessels. He said, try. That's theoretical. I said, yeah, he said, try. So I did try it. And uh, ironically, the girl sent me a picture She's uh, about, what, 96, about 27, 28 years old now, graduated from the college. And I went, I harvested this uh, three days old ba uh, organs uh, baby and uh, everything went well. 
So always there is always no limits and uh, always try to do your best and the rest is in God's hands. Indication for isolated and tested, <clears throat> uh, just you have to weigh the balance between the complication of the TPN and the uh, complications of transplant. So you have to have a conscious decision. That's why I established the, um, the Medicare criteria based on this, that really every physician has to weigh the risk of living on TPN versus the risk of transplant. So uh, the indication for a small bowel transplant if the patient on TPN and not doing well because of multiple line infections, vanishing of the central veins means extensive central vein thrombosis, liver failure, metabolic disorders, <clears throat> and the cost of TPN and the quality of life together. But the three major components that will uh, put it in Medicare criteria to consider a small bowel at the standard of care are the multiple line infections, the vanishing of the central veins, central vein thrombosis, and impending liver failure or liver uh, injury with high elevated liver enzymes and or cholestasis or cirrhosis. For the liver intestine, uh, you have to have a TPN associated liver failure or cirrhosis to another reason. And those who have a, a portal uh, or a portal and with or without mesenteric vena thrombosis uh, with the liver failure. Even if you do, you're not in TPN and you have liver failure and you cannot restore the blood flow, portal blood flow to the liver, then you may consider liver intestine or a multiviscera. Although for the last uh, 10 or 15 years, we're able to develop some techniques to restore the portal flow uh, to uh, the transplanted liver uh, with the uh, portocabal or portorenal uh, transposition to avoid the need for intestinal liver or multiviscera. For the multiviscera, which includes transplanting all the abdominal organs, including the stomach, duodenum, and pancreas, and intestine. Uh, then you, uh, those who had diffuse gastrointestinal disorders, this motility syndromes, Gardner syndrome with involvement of the stomach, duodenum, and the intestine, and extensive vascular thrombosis uh, that was major uh, mesenteric and, and, and uh, gastrointestinal varices. Just uh, for your own knowledge that uh, you differentiate between liver, intestine, and multiviscera or modified multiviscera by inclusion of, by including the stomach as in block with the transplanted organ. If the any patient received any intestine with the stomach in it, then it's a multiviscera. And of course, with the in addition to the pancreas and the DDM. Full, if the liver is part of the allograft, modified if the liver is not part of the allograft. And this is an example of a patient uh, who had uh, uh, diffuse uh, gut dysmotility. And uh, you can see on your left-hand side, the whole abdominal cavity is empty. There is the diaphragm on the right side, diaphragm on the left side. You have only two vascular clamps clamping the uh, celiac trunk. And um, here after the organs are reperfused, the whole multivisceral organs. And they, uh, this patient had a video on the uh, Discovery Channel um, uh, uh, telling the story about my personal life and what I do um, in the operating room. It's uh, called Surgery Saved My Life. Of any of the audience of the audience who are interested to see the action in the operating room, then they uh, Google my name and you see surgery saved my life in the Discovery Channel, and uh, they will see the movie. And um, uh, this is uh, in 2009. I felt obligated that I have to present the outcome with five, when I finished 500 intestinal and multiviscera transplantation, 
and that represented about 25% of the worldwide experience at that time. And uh, if you can see for uh, if the young generation listening to what I'm saying, I didn't focus on the success. I focus on the problem that needs to be solved. You can see that major advances with new challenges because for uh, my young colleagues that don't focus on your success, uh, focus on how can you advance in the field you're interested in. And then also uh, maybe three years later, I showed the quality of life for those who survived beyond the, the five years time and how many of these patients achieved uh, full nutritional autonomy with better quality of life. This is an example, if you can see in your left-hand side, um, uh, this is a French girl, her name is Virginia. She had a transplant in 1989, and, um, and then uh, uh, the one of the few patients have a successful isolated intestine before I started the program in 1990 in Pittsburgh. And that's her on cyclosporin. You can see she's afraid to smile because of the cyclosporin. I talked to uh, Oliver Goulet, her gastroenterologist in the University of Paris, and we switched her to Prograv, and she's 33 years old now. She definitely had some, uh, some sort of uh, limited intellectual functions, uh, but she's still alive, doing well. And this Tracy, one of my, my patients uh, from Pittsburgh, and um, and I have a picture with her when she was 25 years old. She's a teacher. She's 31 years after transplant. And also, some of these patients can get married and have a reproductive life. And you can see here, she's more than 35 years now. She has isolated liver, she had my rotation, she developed wall plus, she lost the intestine, I give her intestine in Pittsburgh. And, um, and uh, this is another, you know, you can see a few examples of the uh, indicating a better quality of life. Now, I think we may have another 10 minutes, but I'm gonna share with you why I, devoted the rest of uh, maybe another 12 or 14 years of my life now to develop the field of surgical gut rehabilitation. Why? Because there is limitation for intestinal and multivisceral transplantation, even more than the uh, uh, other solid organ transplant. One problem is peculiar for the intestine is uh, rejection. Um, and the intestine is an unforgivable organ. So if you, um, if you uh, miss rejection of the intestine for 24 hours and 48, you may lose the intestine. You will not be able to bring the intestine back. So you can see here uh, that this is sloughed mucosa, still have some crypts. Once you see some crypts, it encourages you to treat these patients aggressively with the uh, uh, anti-lymphocyte preparation with the hope for the intestine to recover. Some of these patients, they continue to reject and they lose the bowel. And the second sinister problem is the uh, chronic rejection. A uh, good number of patients, particularly with donor-specific antibody, they develop over the years. They uh, develop, uh, as you say, C vascular arteriopathy, and the chronic rejection to the extent of the intestine and instead of four meters becomes amalgamated like a small, tiny um, uh, mass you can hold in your hand and you have to take it out. The dangerous problem that I always broke my heart when I always broke my heart when I see it is the development of graft versus host disease. So although the incidence is not that high, but it's very difficult to control. Incidence about five to eight percent less in the in the adults and the higher in the children, and more with the multivisceral transplant, uh, and uh, less much less with the isolated intestine and liver intestine because of the 
transplanted lymphoid cell mass. Just uh, quickly here, this is a paper we published in 2015 with uh, the uh, International Transplant Society. And uh, as you can see here, a uh, uh, few centers in the initiation, when we established this uh, clinical reality of small bowel transplant in, um, in 1990, there are about 79 centers across the globe. And um, uh, recently they shrank to 35 because of many reasons. Uh, one of it is the difficult uh, uh, difficulty to manage this patient and you need a multidisciplinary team approach that needs a dedicated young generation to do it. But the very interesting thing in this slide, as you can see, Africa is the only continent that small bowel transplantation, to the best of my knowledge, has never been done or published. So hopefully we will do something in Egypt uh, uh, within the next six months, a year. The reason not the technical reason is the uh, multidisciplinary team approach and the post-operative care. So I'm training uh, quite a few fellows here from Egypt. Uh, almost two thirds of my fellows are Egyptian. So I can teach them how to take care of these patients after the transplant. The small bowel transplant or multivisera, I believe will be the standard of care for any patients with recalcitrant gut disorder. Doesn't matter if and gut failure or not, is when we achieve the dream of transplant tolerance. Uh, you can see this is Peter Medwar, uh, who was the ge geologist in, uh, in, in England, and he is of Lebanese descent. And he was the first to prove in animal study the, uh, the, uh, the uh, concept of tolerance. I uh, work with the Starzl on the chimerism policy or chimerism strategy or theory. And it did help some patients. And in a paper I published in the, in the uh, International uh, Transplant Journal. And, uh, but it doesn't, didn't work for almost everyone. Now, um, the next uh, group of slides talking about gut rehabilitation, showing some innovative techniques and integration of management. And I wonder, maybe it's, um, it's about 40 slides. And I wonder maybe we can uh, you know, end here and reconvene in one of your other uh, uh, seminars. Okay, yes thing with this slide because it's too much to uh, digest at once okay i just uh, right now i will send to you the possible dates for the next webinar we can, it can be as uh, as soon as in two weeks so i sent you some you're uh, a, Shisham, you're a slave driver you are a slave driver. You are abusing me, but I'm doing it for Dr. Metha so he can enjoy it. When you, I sent you the possible dates. When you have time, uh, you, oh, you pick up, you pick up my the pleasure, dates. But I hope that uh, the new generation of people are listening. You can put this in the website. You, you know, I just, uh, I didn't want to be wasting your time or my time. Or Dr. The Metha. recording will be on YouTube. Yeah, I want people. I want people to benefit from this because I don't want to die with all of this in my head. I want to. I will it send you by tomorrow. It will be the recording from today will be on YouTube. Every I post every recording on YouTube. Oh, excellent, excellent, Doctor Medhat, you should be proud of him. <laughs> Wait, I'll, um. Are you proud of Dr. Hisham? Yeah, sure. All right. <laughs> yeah. Sure, that's, uh, sure is not I have a... one question for you. Huh? I have one question. One, I many questions. Whoever want to ask question, I'm glad to answer. If you have a question, please raise your hand. Okay, Hisham? Uh, yes, go ahead, Dr. Metcalf, of course. 
Uh, is there any trophic substance which will stimulate the gut for rehabilitation or adaptation in the serum of these patients? So you, you, you're trying to steal the next start? No, I mean, uh, okay, we'll uh, leave it for the next talk. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Uh, you will okay. have all the answers. Okay, so next talk is going to be... Uh, we'll start with the go into the technical details. Technical medical rehabilitation, how to augment the gut adaptation, what are the biologic agents that were able to develop, will be, be utilized, and then the surgical interventions for the different pathology. The, you know, you get, yeah, whoever listening to us, you should put a good announcement because. To me, this is an, what we discussed today is, uh, I believe it's, it's historic and more than historic, but paving the way that at least for Egypt now, what the young guys can do and help the patient rather than letting them die. Okay, so we look forward to the next talk with you, sir. Okay, any other questions? I think the, all the questions will be next time. <laughs> no. What about all that stuff about transplant and biophysiology and all that stuff? Mm. Either, yeah, nobody, or either nobody's listening or I did not get my message across. No, I think people are anticipating the next part, the technical part. I think everyone will going to be is <laughs> waiting for the next talk. <laughs> oh, okay. Okay, so I sent you the so date. They, so they they wouldn't understand the technical part unless they uh, digest what I said today. They will take their time and digest until next time. <laughs> <laughs> okay. They will follow Tamiya, sir. Yes, huh? uh, it takes time. <laughs> Okay. We have a question from Dr. Gamal Amira. Hi, Dr. Gamal. Actually, I'm sorry I couldn't get the lecture from the start. I was working till uh, uh, nine. I'm working. <laughs> You're too old to work all the time. <laughs> Take some leisure time, and I cannot see your wonderful face because it's too dark there. <laughs> so I was just uh, want to say to you hello, and uh, I hope to see you soon, uh, Doctor Karim. In any time, inshallah. Inshallah, inshallah. Best of luck. Uh, so, Best of... <laughs> so we look forward to the next talk. Please, Doctor Karim, pick up one of the dates I sent you. Sure, but if it's too late or that's too early, I mean, uh, the Egyptian usually like they'll khufash, maybe, maybe <laughs> Regarding Satis Abilayl, Yani? Ah. Now we've been doing this at this time for two years now. And, and well, it doesn't mean it's right or wrong. You have <laughs> audience. Up to 30. Yeah, up to 30. Today we have 15, 16. All right. I mean, I mean in the whole country of Egypt, that is disappointing. Uh, just uh, they get millions of physicians really need to know all that stuff. So you may advertise a little bit or, or help a little bit uh, these people to uh, really, um, because the life of many thousands of patients in their hands. Correct. All right. Okay. All right. Thank you all, okay, and, uh, and I'll see you in a uh, in, uh, in few weeks. Okay, thank you, Dr. Karim. I'm looking forward to your reply on WhatsApp. Okay. Oh, my, my God. I mean, for God's sake, harder, harder. <laughs> okay, thank you, Doc. Thank you all for attending, and uh, good night. Okay, see you next week. It's pulled down.